and memory. So digital communication and memory. When we're talking about uh, digital communication or digital memory, it's important to understand that computers only understand two things, on or off. So a computer is going to take a look at a bunch of information and broken down to its simplest form, that information is either a one or a zero, an on or an off. That is one bit of information in computer talk. If I had eight of those, that would be one byte of information. And those eight bits that make up one byte, they could be any combination of ones and zeros. And as a matter of fact, there's 256 different combinations of ones and zeros in an eight bit byte. Most computers nowadays, they're not 8-bit computers anymore. They're, uh, the operating system that you have on you know, your Windows machine is most likely a 64-bit. So we're dealing with a lot more information at once. But in its simplest form, one byte of information is 8 bits, 8 on or off signals. When it comes to getting information, you know, a byte or a bit of information from one place to another, Typically what we do is we connect devices with either serial or parallel communication cables. Parallel communication, uh, assuming we're only talking about 8-bit here, would mean that I would have eight wires and that message would get transmitted, that complete byte of information would get transmitted simultaneously down all eight wires at the same time. If I had serial communication, that would mean I'd only have one wire and I would transmit sequentially that same bit of information down one wire as a series of ones and zeros. So when it comes to different types of communications, parallel would inherently be faster than serial and yet we don't use parallel very much anymore these days. And the type of communication that we're talking about in terms of CAN bus systems is actually a form of serial communication. USB, universal serial bus, is another popular one that we use. We use serial communications nowadays because the technology is good enough that we can communicate very, very rapidly, even using serial. We don't really need to use parallel uh, for peripheral uh, connections anyways. You know, typically if we're talking about on the motherboard of a computer, then it's possible that we're gonna have, you know, parallel communications between uh, things like memories and processors and graphics cards and so forth. So to get information from one place to another, it's just ons and offs. It's just ones and zeros. And the way we group those together and the different combinations of them make different bits of digital information. If you want to store that information, then we have volatile or non-volatile memory that we typically store it on. And when we're talking about volatile and non-volatile, Different types of ROM memory, read-only memory, those are typically non-volatile, or sorry, uh, non-volatile memory. Volatile memory would be a type of memory where you have to have power maintained to the memory chip all the time or else you lose whatever is stored on there. So RAM is a great example of volatile memory. It's used in pretty much every electronic device but it's not used for long-term storage. It's a very fast type of memory. And that fast memory is used to store stuff that we need immediately between the raw or sorry, the RAM and the processor. ROM is for long-term storage. It's a slower type of memory. So we don't necessarily need to access it and have rapid access to that data, but we need to have it there when we need it. So that's what ROM is. And when it comes to ROM um, in you know, today's terminology, uh, stuff like uh, flash memory. OK. 
Okay. That EMMC memory or, uh, you know, USB drives or SD cards, you know, those types of memory. That's flash memory. Going back, you know, DVD, CD, you know, those types of disk memory, that would be types of ROM as well. Once the data is actually stored on that memory, it's there, but that is uh, permanent memory. With the flash memory type stuff, that is not straight ROM, that would be electronically erasable, programmable, read-only memory. That means that you can read and write and then you can erase and write again. So different types of memory for different applications, non-volatile slower, it doesn't need to have power to, to maintain what's stored on there. Volatile memory, RAM, and then you know that uh, keep alive memory that we sometimes see on machines where we have to have a battery cable connected, otherwise we lose stuff, you know, radio presets that used to be a thing. Um, that would be for your keep alive memory. So when it comes to digital communication, what it is we're actually communicating back and forth, um, you know, whether that be uh, parallel or serial, we got to get that information from one place to another. And then if we need to store the memory, then we have various different types of memory we can store it in. Um, what are we actually working with though? We're working nowadays with a system that looks like this. So this is a CAN bus system. Now this CAN bus system here, that uh, really basic, we're only showing two controllers here and we've got an active and a passive terminator. Inside of our terminators, we have some resistors. Those resistors are 120 ohms. The controllers are connected via CAN high and CAN low. CAN high and CAN low shown in yellow and green here, uh, communicate information between the controllers. The controllers are probably connected to several sensors. They may have some actuators shown in solenoids here. Uh, those controllers may also have other small controllers or uh, other networked components, I should say, that communicate via a secondary CAN network. When I connect those sensors via a secondary CAN network to a main controller, that creates a subnetwork, sometimes called a LIN bus, a local interconnect network bus. Those are smart sensors. These other components here would be discrete. There's your LIN bus. Something else, it's not shown on this diagram, but I will add it in is a diagnostic test connector. If you happen to be a John Deere tech, they'll call that an EDL connector. That's gonna have power and ground, can high and can low connected to it. And this is the way that we can tap into the system with our, with our laptop and do some things like pull fault codes, take a look at live parameters, um, command outputs, tell the controller to turn on and off such and such an output so that we can see if that system, that circuit is functioning. Okay, so your laptop isn't able to speak directly 
with the CAN bus system. We need what's effectively a translator. Okay, and that data link, um, again, in the John Deere world, you'd probably call that an EDL connector. If you're Cummins, you might call it your inline five or inline six. Uh, if you know you're a cat guy, you might call it um, you know COM two or COM three. But really, all it is is just a little box that acts like a translator, so that the computer, which is speaking on you know the USB and the uh, CAN bus, which is probably speaking on you know SAEJ nineteen thirty nine standards, so that they can communicate. That DTC is also a really good spot for us to tap into the CAN and do some basic testing to see if there's a reason why things aren't working as we expect them to work. One of the things that we can do is check resistance. Okay, so we're checking resistance on the CAN. If I've got 220 ohm resistors in parallel, which if you take a look at this between the yellow and the green, those 220 ohm resistors in parallel should equal 60 ohms if you have an intact CAN. You need to know your system because some systems are fairly small. If the physical length of the CAN isn't very long, if the number of controllers is quite few, you don't need two terminating resistors necessarily. In some manufacturers, they only have one on there. And in that case, if there's only a single resistor, then you'll see 120 ohms instead of 60. But you need to know your system because if there was supposed to be two in there, but all you see is one, you got a bad terminator or you have it open somewhere in your can. Resistance is one thing. And bear in mind that when you're checking resistance, you always check resistance with the can powered down. And usually, I'm not gonna say every time, but usually that's uh, pins C and D on your nine pin but double check and see where it's coming up to it. So you check your resistance and the resistance is one thing that tells us the can is good, but it's not the only thing. The other thing that we can look at is voltage. Okay, on can high and can low. The voltage on can high, if there's communication happening, should show something higher than whatever the carrier voltage of the can is. The carrier voltage on the CAN is typically two and a half volts on CAN high and low. And then for CAN high to pull up above and CAN low to pull down below, the transceiver in the control unit is going to pull CAN high up with a quick five volt and pull CAN low with a quick ground. Now, because your multimeter can't respond fast enough to see that, CAN high is going to look something like 2.5 to 3.5 volts and can low 1.5 to 2.5 volts. The important thing is you wanna see a spread between them. If they're both sitting at the exact same voltage, that means there's no communication happening. So you can verify if that can has the potential to work by checking to see if you've got the correct resistance and seeing if you got the correct voltage. Now, sometimes your can still doesn't work because sometimes maybe you've got a bad controller in the system and that controller is effectively taking down the can. It's not letting communication happen because something has failed. So one thing that you can do is you can remove the controllers one by one from the system and see when the can comes back online and when the rest of the controllers come back online by disconnecting individual controllers and seeing if that helps the rest of it to wake up. That's one thing you can do. All right. So another thing that we should all bear in mind is that the tools that we use, if, if you've been you know, in class with me for a little while, you know that one of the things that I always try and teach is don't trust your tools, always verify your tools. If you're having communication issues and you're trying to communicate with the machine, one of the things that you should do is check the most suspect items. You got a USB cable and you got the cable uh, between your EDL connector, your common adapter there. Those cables, if you think about how those typically get handled in the toolbox, you've got that data link 
And then you've got that long USB cable that usually gets wrapped around it or that thing gets slammed on the door and broken or it's sitting on, you know, some tracks or something. Somebody steps on it, crushes the wires inside. If you're having trouble getting your laptop to connect to the machine, check the cables on your comm adapter first. And when it comes to those USB cables, because those are the thing that takes the worst licking of everything here, maybe have a spare USB cable with you all the time. Just so you can swap it out and see if that's the reason why it's not working. Take a look on your data link. Is there power showing? Is the data light on that data link flashing? Is there communication trying to happen? Another thing to keep in mind is on your laptop, sometimes you've got something called port mapping in the service software that you're using. Port mapping simply means that laptop, when you open up that service software program is looking for a data link on one of the USB ports, a very specific USB port. And it's not gonna look for that data link on any other USB ports on that laptop, except for the one that has been assigned to it. So if you run into that, more and more manufacturers in our service software are moving away from that. But if you do run into that, that means there's a designated USB port on the laptop that you have to plug that um, USB cord into. And you can check and see if you go into the software configuration, a lot of times you can check and see if there was a port that was assigned to that. Another thing that you can do is on your laptop, you can open up your device manager and you can plug in that USB and unplug it and see if the laptop's even recognizing your device when you plug it in. And you can also see which port it is you're plugged into. If you guys want to know how to do that, uh, that's one of those things that when we're in the shop and we're using those service software laptops to work on the machines and you wanna know how to look that up, I'll show you, okay? So when it comes to the CAN bus and how it works, the basic idea is that it's controllers sending information to one another on the CAN bus. For it to work, the CAN bus has to be intact. You have to have the right number of intact terminating resistors. You have to have a carrier voltage present and you have to have a voltage spread evident between CAN high and CAN low. That voltage spread is what's indicating that there's communication trying to happen. If all of that basic stuff is, is there and there's still no communication, it's possible that you've got a bad controller or more specifically, a bad transceiver node in one of the controllers is taken down the can. So to figure out which one it is, you just take it out of the picture. Just disconnect and see if the other controllers now wake up and can talk to one another. You can take this a step further. Uh, you can use a scope and you can put your scope on your pins. And using that, you can, you can look at the CAN signal. And if you looked at the CAN signal, you'd see that CAN high and CAN low should be nice, clean. That should be nice, clean digital signals traveling down those wires in unison. All right. So can high would be pulling above two and a half, can low be pulling below two and a half. And this right here would be 2.5 volts on the middle. On a scope, this is what you'd want to see. But if you saw something that looked like this on can high, but can low is a nice clean signal, you would know there's a problem with the can. So if you have a scope available to use, that is one of the things that you can do. You should see uh, pretty clean and uniform between can high and low, just mirror images of the same information along those can high and low wires. If physically everything looks good, and you know if you happen to have a scope, um, your, uh, your can signal looks good as well, and you connect up your laptop and you're trying to make uh, connections so that you can do some troubleshooting, but nothing's happening, check your cables, look at your data link, see if you got a data light flashing, look if you got power. Verify that you got power at your DTC as well. Your data link typically draws its power from the DTC, not necessarily through the USB. 
If you've got no communication, make sure that the program that you're using is not uh, one of those ones that's got port mapping inside of it. If it doesn't, then which USB port you're plugged into shouldn't matter. Check and see if your cables are good. Check and see if your data link is good, that kind of stuff, okay? So there we have a pretty good overview of everything we expect to see in the CAN, how to test it, how memory and communication actually works and what to do with our service software.